Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new let's play of Gear City. Gear City is an incredible game. It's an indie management simulation strategy in which you take control of a car manufacturer and you invent and design vehicles that you then sell on the world market. Now this game apart from being incredibly complex, has one of the best developers that I have ever met. The game has came out in 2014 in early access, which is when I first featured it on my channel, and it is still being updated up to this day. It's incredible, and Eric, who is pretty much the only guy and the owner of the development studio uh, working on this game, is unbelievably dedicated, involved in the community, and just an overall great person, which shows how great the games can be if they get the care they deserve. So this is the reason why I have been following Gear City for all these years, and I have decided that I am going to feature it on my channel again, now that it is an amazing product, and no longer an early access game, and that we are going to delve into it together maybe in a one maybe in more campaigns depending on how you guys will like it now <laughs> a word of warning the game is incredibly complex i'm gonna do whatever i can to make it uh pleasurable for your viewing but there will be moments where I will get genuinely lost. I'm not pretending like I know everything about the game. But that's going to be the fun of it. Uh, I have played it over the years a bit, uh, learned a bit about the game. But I usually go bankrupt uh, fairly fast. So we're going to try to not go that route. On the other hand, I know a few strategies that uh, make the game incredibly easy. And I'm going to avoid those as well. Try not to game the game too much. So, yeah. Let's just have fun together. So this uh, this first episode will be a bit more about the introduction to the game and how it works. But later on, I'm gonna get more uh, involved in the game itself and less about uh, you know the system and how everything works. So let's start the game and we'll see how it goes. So here we are on the first screen where we need to design our game. I'm gonna call this game uh, Let's Play Game. We are going to start in the year 1900 where the well car industry was actually starting as well. We're gonna play on normal difficulty which is actually way harder than you would have guessed. Uh, and we are going to play with the base cinemap which is my favorite. Let's continue, and here we are in the actual map. Each of these red dots that you can see on the screen is a city that you can open a branch in, open a factory in, and sell. Each of these cities have a number of statistics that are actually kind of important. Uh, this, this shows you how the city or where the cities are located. This shows you the income per capita, which shows how much money they have and what kind of money they can spend on a car. Now you can see that the only place, honest, where it's worth starting is uh, Europe, most of Western and Northwestern Europe, and United States. It's kind of fun to pretend like you can start playing in Africa, but you can't, trust me, you cannot. Not uh, until later on. The game has a fairly good uh, economic model. You can see how the growth will happen. So you can see that most of the world, including Africa, Russia, Japan, will get much better as time goes by and will open new markets for us. Uh, there's also infrastructure that decides on how well and expen how well you can transport your cars to the market and how expensive it is. Uh, there is manufacturing which shows how well you, uh, the people at those cities are able to manufacture the cars for you. There's the growth of manufacturing uh, business. There's the population which is also very important because just having a lot of rich people is not enough. You need these people people to be uh, numerous and there's the 
estimated population growth uh, of the world. So yeah, uh, we are going to start in United States just because last time when I was playing this game in 2014, we started in United Kingdom. Or actually, I think we started in Prague uh, and then in United Kingdom. I think I had two Let's Plays, but I can't recall right now. Uh, so there are a number of cities that interest us. Uh, mostly it's New York here, but also Philadelphia. This will serve as a basic market for us. These are one of the biggest cities with highest per capita that you can find. I think London is even better. Yes, London is even better, but uh, New York will suffice. But we are actually going to... Uh, I think we're going to start our operation in... Uh, Let's start in Baltimore. Baltimore is... Not, well, average labor wage is 27. It doesn't really matter, right? Okay, you know what? We're going to start in New York. We're going to start in New York. Uh, my name for this is going to be Rudolf Calvin. And our company name... I thought about that and we're going to call it Republic Motors. And we can choose from a number of logos. I actually like this one. And I really like this one. I just realized they're very similar. Let's use this one because it's something new. Uh, another thing that greatly decides on the difficulty of the game is how many AI companies there will be. I tried with 300 companies. It's unbelievably tough there's so much competition that it's ridiculous uh, so you know I decided that I'm gonna start with a hundred random AI companies which is together with the normal about the bar that I can easily start in right now and it gets really tough very fast so we're gonna start with that we're gonna have hundred uh, random AI companies plus the normal difficulty so let's start and that will propel us in the game and here we are in our office now I'm gonna quickly go around the office to show you what we have at our disposal but there's many things that I actually don't know which is kind of funny the clock work as a turn skip you end the turns here uh, the books here show you your revenue your operation expenses and stuff like that uh, I'm actually hoping that I will be able to pay way more attention to random things uh, during this playthrough because a lot of the statistics are a bit beyond me. So I want to be really in depth and learn the game as we play because the goal of this Let's Play should be uh, to be able uh, to play it on either hard or nightmare difficulty later on and survive. But I'm going to be happy if we survive in this one as well. Trust me, it's going to get really hard really fast. Uh, this is the um, report. Here you have various challenges, manufacturing news, um, superlatives, awards. That are, you know, we can win prices. You can check uh, the market. You can check, uh, you know, reviews of various cars that the AI and you will put on the market. So it's kind of fun, you know. Here are the news of the world. It's January 1900. New company founded. Uh, 15 city wine nurses discharged. Stock prices in city region post plan formal party. Uh, there's also a phone. You can call human resources, lobbyists, and contracts. I'm not really using that one much. You use uh, <laughs> the super ultra all-in-one mega menu controller to decide on uh, your production, your branches, and stuff like that. We're going to get to it very soon. But first of all, we have to check our safe. And there's a couple of things here that are really interesting. There's your favorite teddy. I was always hoping that it would have some kind of function, but it is just cute. Uh, you can issue bonds here and sell part of your company, which is kind of interesting, but I never do it because I have been always against selling your company. There's also a revolver here for when the game becomes a bit too much. 
And then there is an option here to contact the bank, uh, the shareholders, or you know, to issue to take a bank loan, to issue bonds, or ask for a line of credit. Now, one thing that is very good in the beginning is to immediately take uh, take a loan or issue bonds. We have seven hundred fifty thousand in cash. You can see it in the lower right corner. Our cash flow is zero, but for a long, long time, we are going to work at a loss because we need to uh, in design the uh, we need to design the parts of our vehicle, and then we need to design the vehicle, and then we need to start manufacturing it. So you need a lot of capital for that uh, to be able to actually uh, survive the first few months. Now, at the highest difficulties, like hard and nightmare, I don't think you can actually survive without uh, taking the bonds or a bank loan immediately. Uh, but here we can actually decide if we're going to do it. And I'm going to do it. The amount uh, you ask for increases the coupon rate and the annual coupon payment. You can also lower the maturity date or increase it, which will again um, change the coupon rate and the amount of money you pay every year for it. Now, I think we can go for, say, eight years, um, which will give us a nice annual coupon rate of 5.2% and a payment of 36,000. And we're going to get additional 700,000, so we're going to double our cash. So let's issue the bonds. Uh, it's extremely important that we uh, stay positive because if you fall in the negative and you don't have a positive cash flow, uh, the game gives you, I think, five months or half a year to get back on your feet and then you're done. And of course, no bank will give you money. So you need to keep a strong reserve at all time. So now we are going to go into the R&D department where we are going to design our first vehicle. Now the game works in the way that the vehicle has three main parts. It has a chassis, engine and gearbox and then of course you design the vehicle itself, um, what it will focus on and how it will work. Now I can't accept, uh, I can't access the vehicle design due to the fact that we do not have the chassis, engine and gearbox ready. So we're going to start doing that. Now, in the 1900s, uh, you don't have really a lot of components available and a number of vehicles that you can design is also limited. Uh, before we go then, I'm, I would like to show you some of the stats which is here, uh, body fuel type demand, which show you what kind of cars are desired. We're in North America, so the most desired here, same as in Europe, I think. No, in Europe that's sedan and luxury sedan. But in North America, the most desired car is a Phaeton. Phaeton is a cheap, open car, and sort of like a modern day cabriolet. Uh, cab cabriolet? Do you pronounce it like that in English? I, I, I'm not actually sure. Cabrio. Cabrio. Hmm, weird. I, I don't know how that's pronounced in, if it's even in English. Uh, anyway, the Phaetons basically ended in the 40s, uh, or in the 1940s, uh, because they were put out by other types of car. But now they are still the most popular in North America. So we're going to design a Phaeton. Phaeton has a lot of possibilities, but it's mostly a cheap car that puts heavy emphasis on dependability and on, I think, safety. Yeah, dependability and safety. And otherwise, it should be very cheap. So we're going to start by designing that because it will allow us to get a lot of money. So we're going to start by a chassis. Uh, there's basically two ways how we can design it. There's always assisted and an advanced uh, way. I'm going to go with advanced because uh, I think I understand the game system fairly well. So we're going to start with a carriage frame. Uh, in the early years, horse carriages frames were converted to hold a drivetrain. This conversion is cheap but very inefficient. We're going to have to swallow the bullet here and take it. I don't want to wait. I think in about six months we're going to get a ladder frame, which is much better, but you know, no need to wait for that. 
As you can see, it's not very good. Its strength, performance, safety, and durability is abysmal. But it has a good weight, design, manufacturing, and cost. It's basically extremely cheap and easy to use, but it doesn't perform very well. Uh, here you can see some of the information. It's a lightweight design. It should not give our engineers any issues. Uh, design allows for easy mass production and low cost design allows for higher margins but it is a weak frame design is a poor cherries for handling comfort and performance basically we're gonna phase it out immediately as when we can uh, we're gonna so you select the drivetrain there are two ways how your car can do right now we only have uh, front engine rear wheel drive which is a bit weird uh, way how to say that this is the way wait no this is a front engine rear wheel drive ah okay my bad uh basically it means the engine is in the front but you power the rear uh rear uh wheels so front engine rear wheel drive was the most common drivetrain until the 90s by placing the engine in the front of the vehicle and powering the rear wheels the vehicle maintains a good weight ratio the vehicle will also have better traction and acceleration from oh under acceleration front engine rear wheel drive vehicles are more expensive to manufacture but they have increased performance characteristics and are easy to design compared to that is a uh, rear engine rear wheel drive vehicles which have their engine position above or behind the rear axle the sand eliminates torque steer but oversteer is a major problem since all the weight is in the rear uh, rear engine rear wheel drive engines increase grip during acceleration but suffer from understeer in corners they have great performance but below average handling designs can become complex if the engine requires cooling so when you compare these there's a bit of a difference here you can see that both have mediocre handling but the fr drivetrain has a better drivability and performance uh, its durability is also better but the weight is worse uh, it's a bit more tricky to no, actually, less tricky to design it and less tricky to manufacture it, but... Wait, what are the advantages then? <laughs> I'm just checking that. Wow, it's actually extremely poor in everything. I never realized that. I keep using the FR drivetrain, honestly. It's, it's my favorite for the start. So I'm most familiar with it. Then we have the suspension. There is a couple of suspensions already available to us. There's the leaf spring, uh, there's the sliding pillar and trailing arm. We're gonna use the leaf spring because it's the most durable and durability is very important for a phaeton. The leaf spring is one of the earliest forms of spring systems. By the way, it was used even in some of the modern trucks. It's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, leaf springs consist of several flat metal sheets laid on top of each other. This helps distribute load across the spring. Leaf springs are durable, cheap, and easy to design. However, they perform below average on every other metric. Well, they do, but if you check, the durability is extremely, extremely good compared to sliding power and trailing arm. So I tend to use it until better choices become available. And we're going to use the same one for rear suspension. So you, when you design a chassis, you take uh, the type of the carriage, you design where the drivetrain is going to be, and then you take suspensions for front and the rear uh, part of the carriage. So we're going to take that, and now comes the fun part. The designing. The designing is actually kind of tricky to master because it has a number of various options here that you need to take care into consideration. And wait, I'm going to show it once more. There's frame dimensions, suspensions, design focus, component quality. Then you have the summary. Now, what does this mean? Basically, you can influence the statistics that are down here by moving these sliders. Uh, it's actually pretty cool because you can design a number of variants, cheap ones, expensive ones, one that have uh, their 
focus on, uh, say, durability, one that have focus on suspension, one that have design on, um, on uh, you know, the dis- right control or dependability, and then you can influence the overall statistics by being cheap on material quality, component quality, technology. There's a lot of things that you can do here. But I just realized one thing, which is kind of a fail, but I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to have to say that. Uh, I forgot that you need to design engine first. The reason for that is that you have these wheelbase and maximum supported engine length and width. And we'll need to design this along our first engine and not the other way around. So my apologies for that. I just explained how the design of <laughs> the frame or the chassis works and now we have to jump back to train so apologies about that but this is how you do in uh, in gear city so engine you you will now know the basic system so we can go a bit faster through it with the engine so you can see that we have a bunch of options here already available we have the v layout steam single cylinder rotary layout radial layout straight layout flat layout and electric which is kind of interesting i was not aware that electric cars were one of the first designs that actually came to the market it's an interesting way to look at um, the fact that we're doing a, f- a circle here uh, in the modern time. But yeah, uh, I'm going to just go through it, comment on some of the engines and how I use them. But uh, I'm going to tell you immediately, then we're going to start with the single cylinder. Because it's the cheapest, easiest engine, and we need to get some practice in manufacturing. So, electric engine. I'm gonna be honest, I never used it. It looks like it's very smooth, has decent stats in reliability or basically best stats in reliability, but it's awful to design. It's very heavy. Uh, its size is also kind of weird or, you know, mm, for what it gives you, the size is kind of weird. And yeah. I think you can get back to it later on when you need it, but for now it's it's a meh, and I never really got to a point where I could play with it. Flat layout is pretty awesome, uh, has very good stats, but its length and width is actually kind of hard. I use these for bigger cars like trucks, so it's not bad. Straight layout is one of my favorites together with uh, the V layout because it has decent stats, uh, you can play around with it. Its length is not that good, but reliability is great. It's not very hard to design, and it might be one of the first designs that we're gonna do after the single cylinder engine. Radial layout and rotary layout are kind of weird. I tried to play with them, but I'm not gonna lie, I never made them work. The straight layout and uh, V layout always seemed a bit better. Not sure uh, why, but the performance, I guess I just mm, work with these better, even though they might seem they have a, a bit worse stats. Then there's the single cylinder. It's kind of a funny one. Uh, you can do incredible things with it, but it's just a very basic engine that works for some of your very early cars later on. Just forget about it. But you can see that with the exception of smoothness, smoothness which is understandable, it has only one cylinder, it's the best of them all. There's also steam. Never used it. Seems like a great, uh, great engine to do. But again, length, width, reliability, and weight is just awful. The rest seems kind of okay. But yeah, uh, check out the designs on the steam <laughs> steam engine cars. It's kind of cool. And I also find it hilarious that it is recommended for sports cars. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Maybe we can do some, some incredible things with it later on. Check it out. I'm not sure. We're going to see. Okay, so we're going to go with a single cylinder engine. Uh, it has only the option of a single cylinder. This is based on each of the engines you get. If you be, if we take, for example, the steam, we get steam cylinders. If we take the V layout, you can have two, four, uh, six. If you take radio, you get three or five. So it's based on the engine type that you take. 
Uh, the single cylinder engine has only one cylinder. They are small, cheap and easy to design, but with only one cylinder there are too weak to power larger vehicles. Engineers should only use them in the early years of automotive history. Exactly what I said. The pros are low cost designs and this design should not give our engineers an issue. It allows for easy mass production and it's white weight. Yeah, the rest, the design leads to rough idling and vibrations, we do not recommend it for passenger vehicles, but it's recommended for sports and micro car. <laughs> Single cylinder, the only option. You can again see smoothness and power is awful, design is awful, but fuel, weight, manufacturing cost and reliability is great. But we have two options for fuel. We have the gasoline. Uh, also known as petrol, most common type of vehicle fuel. It is a petroleum-based fuel that is highly explosive. It supersedes ethanol in the early 1900s and continued to be the top fuel source for automobiles in the modern era. Later on we're gonna get uh, diesel and other things, but right now we have just the gasoline. There's also E85, which is ethanol. Uh, I don't have much experience with it. It was added, I think, recently, and as you can see, it doesn't have very good stats. So we're gonna just keep with the gasoline. It's it's a bit more popular than gasoline, which is interesting, and it provides more power. But that's the only good thing that it has. So let's stick with gasoline. The valve train. There's a couple of ways how you can uh, design your engine right now. I used to use the two-stroke. Most two-stroke motors require mixed fuel and lubrication. The crankcase delivers air and fuel into the cylinder. Because of this, the fuel has to supply lubrication from the cylinder walls. Two-stroke engines are easier to build and are cheap. They have great reliability but suffer from extremely poor emissions, noise and smoothness. I used this usually at the start, but eventually I realized using the... Uh, which one was it? Yeah, the T-Wolf, even though that it has way worse size and design, is much better because it is way more reliable, which we need, and it uses better fuel, um, fuel efficiency and has a better smoothness. And I think also, okay, the power is not here, but the RPMs are, you know, still decent. So I now design my early engines with the T-Valve. In induction system, we only have natural aspirated. Natural aspirated engines use only atmospheric pressure to draw in air into the combustion system. This is the most common type of induction system found in internal combustion engines. So let's use natural aspirated, and now we can design the engine. So for this one, you have the following options, layout, performance, technology, and design focus. Now I know what I want here. I want a really, big engine and by big you know um it's a it's a one cylinder engine so even if you make it the biggest size that you can uh which will lower by the way the price if you check down here if you make it a larger it actually lowers the price because it's easier to manufacture uh it will be still tiny very tiny if you use for example uh the v-shaped uh, V-shaped uh, engine. It even if you reduce the length to a minimum, it's still going to be bigger than your single uh, cylinder engine, which is kind of understandable, you know. So we're gonna increase the length and width because we do want uh, to make it cheaper, and also uh, it lowers the design requirement, so it's gonna be faster to invent it. We are going to increase the weight as well, which will further lower the price and the project cost. But I think that this one actually makes the engine... Yeah, it lowers the torque and the power of the engine, but I don't really mind. Uh, it's not, not that important. But we are also going to increase the bore and stroke of the engine to make it a bit more powerful. Uh, I don't really have much in mind here. Let's just go with 100 for both and see what kind of engine we're getting. So we have a 3 horsepower engine with a 25 torque. It weighs 115 kilograms. Uh, it's not bad. I don't think we can get much more from it at this point. The cost is back to $161 per piece, which is not bad. It's not bad. Uh, engine performance. 
Now, what I do here in the early phases, I always slightly lower the material quality, the component quality, the technology, and the manufacturing techniques, because I want the engine to be slightly cheaper. It hurts the overall stats, but it helps with the design. Uh, we are going to increase, though, the revolutions and the engine torque to make it slightly more powerful. I would like to get it yeah, to at least 5 horsepower, and the torque is 27, so that's decent the fuel economy we're gonna max out because we want our early engine to be well, if not great it could at least be fuel efficient but that lowered my engine power so I'm gonna need to focus a bit more on the performance and that does not really help much yeah I'd have to max it out on the way here hmm well, you focus on dependability, which we have to. The reliability goes all the way up to 55, but the engine already costs 249. I usually go for mm, about 200 per piece. So, can I lower it somewhere? Okay, let's lower the fuel. To 30. We're gonna go with 215, $215 per engine. That's not bad. I can drop the focus on fuel economy a tad more. And this looks like a decent starting engine. We have a 5 horsepower engine. Torque is 25. It's nothing great, but it's our first design, you know. So we have to be realistic here. Uh, it's gonna be enough for what we're going for. The fuel economy is 36, uh, 36 miles per gallon, which is decent. Uh, again, for a starting engine. Project cost is gonna be 72,400 bucks. Now, this is another thing that's kinda important for this kind of, uh, strategy. You need to look into the project cost. Now, I can increase the development pace. We could get this project done in four months, but it would cost $256,000. I could also lower it to a minimum. It would take 44 months and cost only 10,000 bucks. I think that the sweet spot is somewhere around eight months, which is what I usually go for. Then it starts to go up really a lot. So let's see, if we went for seven, it would cost 68,000. If we go for eight, it will cost 44. Okay, let's go for eight months. I think that is decent. Okay, so let's go for this. This engine looks pretty good to me. 214 bucks per piece is decent. Project cost is 44,000. I'm okay with it. Smoothness, smoothness, God damn it, smoothness sucks but otherwise nice fuel power is decent reliability is great which is what we need it is kind of hard to design but okay and manufacturing is decent so let's build the engine and we are going to call it the x1 it's going to be our first no actually you know what let's go with spark i like it let's go with spark so you can now see that we are designing the engine. It's going to be ready in eight months. It's a, a single cylinder engine with overall rating of 25, 214 bucks per piece, not bad. So now what we can do is we can design, uh, let's, let's go with the gearbox. I kind of like the gearbox. And then we're gonna put it in our chassis. So uh, we have only two uh, well, actually, three things here, and there's gonna be one extra option which I'm gonna show you later. Uh, this is kind of interesting non sync manual uh, gearbox type. I had no idea that this existed because I'm, I'm a driver myself, and it was kind of cool to learn about the engines this way. A non synchronized manual transmission is a manual transmission that does not synchronize the gear changes. It requires a skilled operator who can coordinate timing shifts and use techniques such as double clutching or flow shifting. I actually had to Google these techniques. It's, it's actually really interesting. But the next one we're going to get is a sync manual, which is what you use today in modern cars. 
uh, if you don't have an automatic transmission. So it came available in 1890. Its movements is horrifying, but it's a decent performance. Comfort is awful, fuel is not great, but weight design, manufacturing, and cost is great. Gears. Now this, we don't have a lot of options here. We have one, two, three, and four. I'm gonna go with four, if, with three, that seems decent. Uh, more gears gives better result because of broader range of ratios. This should improve power, performance, and fuel consumption. More gears are more complex. Yeah, it tells you the same thing for each of these. Basically, you go one way and down the other way. So free speed is going to be our transmission and add-ons. We can have a reverse gear, which I want, and then there's a trans axle, which decreases the weight of the engine, but increases material cost, design cost, and manufacturing. I still put it on. Uh, so both of these... I put on which is the option that I've been speaking about so we're gonna have a reverse gear and a transaxle uh, by the way I never really found out if the free speed means that you have a rear and then one and two or if you have one two and three and the reverse not sure uh, oh actually one thing that I haven't shown you is this thing Oh yeah, the over oh okay, overdrive. Never mind, my bad. Okay, so uh, for the gear, I could also just make this gear super easy and super cheap, but I don't want to because this gear will last us for at least a couple of cars. So let's uh, put it a bit more care. So I'm gonna reduce the quality as with the engine a bit. Oh, great, great start. But otherwise, I'm just going to keep uh, it reasonable, I would say. We're going to try to increase the fuel efficiency and the top speed and the maximum torque input, which will increase the maximum torque to 135, which is good when we get a better engine. The unit weight is 68 kilos. Uh, not great. Estimated material cost 221. I'm going to try to lower... Uh, the gearbox designed to get to 200 bucks again. We need, however, the dependability as high as possible, which immediately skyrockets the cost. Uh, let's lower the shifting ease a bit. Okay, I guess we're not gonna get to 200 bucks. Yeah, this is not gonna work. Okay, never mind then. We're just gonna keep it like this. 200 bucks, 250 bucks. Uh, I'm okay. It's gonna take eight months, which is the pace that I had for the engine, so I'm okay with it. 98,000 bucks. Okay, can I drop it a bit? No. Come on, it could be something. Okay, 9,000, 256, that's a bit more than I was expecting, but okay, we're going to get the decent, reliable gearbox. So let's build it, and we are going to call this one, um, well, uh, let's call it, I have a, I want to call it freeway, but that, <laughs> that's a bit weird. Uh, so let's call it let's call it junior okay that that's not better but let's call it junior and now we're getting finally back to the chassis that I've been speaking about so we're gonna have a carriage frame FR drive strain leaf spring and leaf spring and when you put in an engine which you design it will tell you if it fits which is extremely important because designing a, f a frame that can't hold your engine is just awful. Now this chassis is going to be designed only for our first car and therefore I'm gonna drop the maximum supported engine length and I'm also going to drop the wheelbase and the track width, yeah. So you can see that as I lower the uh, wheelbase we get cheaper and better design actually, but it also, when you lower the track width, starts to have a problem with the engine. So we can't really lower that much. So 
if I want to lower to a minimum, it has to be here. So yeah, I think the same thing will happen with, no, actually the frame, oh, frame height is not a problem. Oh, that's the wheelbase length. This one lowers it, right? Yeah, maximum engine length and engine width. Yeah, this one lowers the engine length and this one lowers the engine width. So, you know, if you want to not be that cheap on your engine, you can keep the track width slightly bigger, but I'm okay with that. It's We're going to design a better uh, chassis very soon. So uh, the frame weight, I can increase to maximum. I don't really care. It changes the stats a lot. It increases the strength, but lowers the performance. So yeah, let's make it stouter. Uh, the suspension design focus on component quality. You already know the component quality thing that I'm gonna do here. And uh, the suspension. I have to go max with braking because we're gonna have a problem. When you select the engine and the gearbox, it will tell you uh, how the design is going to work. We want to design a phaeton here. So when you view it, it's gonna tell you that the vehicle is getting less than 50% optimal brake specific fuel consumption. This is because the vehicle is too heavy. Now if, well, let me check. If I dropped the weight, it would greatly increase the estimated material cost. Yeah, and it wouldn't make much of a difference. So, okay, let's, let's just keep it up. It doesn't matter. Uh, we want to maybe go a bit cheaper on this. Uh, I want to max out the dependability though, because that's the most important stat for a Phaeton. And let's increase the performance a bit too. But we don't, uh, right control could go up as well. Wow. Um, we don't need much of the strength, so let's drop that. And the right comfort is not that important. I'm gonna lower the stability a bit. And the performance, we're just gonna, yeah, 126 bucks is decent. Now, how long will this project take? Nine months, okay, we're gonna have to make it slight, well, actually durability. Yeah, that's not, that's not bad. I mean, getting dependability of 75, which is awesome. Um, the development pace, though, we need to increase it a bit. Wow, that's, that's jumping up. We had it for 38 bucks, 38,000 bucks, and we're gonna have to go to 63. But okay, it has to be done. We need to have them all at the same time. So, we're gonna take this, this, uh, uh, this chassis, and let's call it just, just the carriage because it actually is. So now you can see that we're designing a chassis, we're designing an engine and a gearbox. All of them will take eight months. So what we're gonna do here, I'm just gonna go back to the office and I'm gonna end one month and you're gonna see how we are doing. Uh, our total expenses were 32,000 and our cash flow was minus 32,000 because we have a factory. I didn't speak about that, but we do have a factory and we do have a branch. Uh, you can close this, close the branch to save a bit of money. But I found out after I calculated it that it is more expensive to then reopen it than to just keep it running. So that's why I'm just going to keep these overhead costs as a, you know, a normal situation. So the cash flow is 32,541 in the negative, and you see that we are hemorrhaging money now. So what we can do here, we're just gonna increase the months to simulate to seven, and when the game is done with this, we can start designing our car. So we have dropped to 1,185,787 in cash, and I think that if I check uh yeah you can see that the bank loan is way lower now no one will take us uh, no one will give us any bonds so the market is not trusting us, us right now we are in a negative for a long time and the only positive here is the cash that we have at hand so let's now go back to the r d and we can see that we have a chassis it has been finished we have an engine and we have a gearbox 
So the time has come now to design our first vehicle. Now this is actually really fun. These are the types of car cars that we can design. There's not all of them. More will come. Some of these are no longer used today. We have a compact, we have a coupe, we have a coupe 2 plus 2, full size sedan, long doorlet. I'm not sure if this is pronounced correctly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think these, these ones are manufactured anymore. Luxury sedan, that one, and micro car is here. We have the town car. I don't think this one is also manufactured anymore. Touring, which is sports car shooting brake. I think these, these ones are extinct as well. Sedan and Roadster, these are, you know, manufactured, same with Roadster. Pickup trucks, of course, these are uh, still present to today. And then we have the Phaeton. The Phaeton is cheap and is very popular in this year. So you can, and you can also see that it has very few requirements compared, for example, to a full-size sedan, which has a lot of requirements. Uh, Phaeton really doesn't have much to say for itself. The performance is, you know, not very important. Same with luxury, power or cargo. What is the most important is dependability and safety. And you saw that I have uh, increased those when I was designing uh, the you know, the components for this. So Phaetons were originally vehicles without any weather protection for passengers. The style came from a horse coach construction in the late 19th and early 20th century. As hard top and soft top vehicles became popular in the 1930s, the original Phaeton style faded away. After this point, Phaetons warped into any convertible or B pillarless vehicles with at least one bench seat out of two rows of seating. So we're gonna design the Phaeton, we're gonna select a chassis here, we're gonna select the engine, and we're gonna select the gearbox. Uh, you choose each of these, so we're gonna use the carriage, carry, carriage uh, chassis, the spark single engine cylinder engine, single cylinder, wait, single cylinder engine, yes and the junior non-synchronous manual gearbox. So let's go inside and you can choose a, uh, a pre-designed vehicle or you can customize and design your own. There's a couple of types, types that you have available to start with. You have, uh, we have type 96, the DCM and the all car. I'm gonna start with the older one, uh, not the oldest one though, with the older one type 96 and I'm going to design it now. Now this takes a bit of time, so I'm gonna speed the recording up so you guys can uh, see how the things are going. So let's start designing. Okay, I think we're finished. This is looking pretty good. A starting car is going to be ready in some time, sometimes around 1902. Uh, I like the design of our first Phaeton. So it's kind of dark, kind of smooth. I chose to just put on one light because I think it makes it look a bit interesting. And oh, actually, I did not repaint uh, the mirror. Okay, this is better. Okay, so let's finish this design and name it, name it, name it, 1902 Phaeton. Okay, so now below here you can see what our Phaeton looks like and what are the requirements. You can see that it's good 
in luxury even though it doesn't really need to the safety is kind of important and we are lacking in it dependability is great it's the most important statistic quality the same fuel yeah bad performance yeah bad but it's not that important power really poor but not that important and handling pretty good even though it's not important cargo kind of important uh and we're sucking at it this is the overall uh, rating and the specific rating based on who you market this car to. So, uh, first of all, again, as usual, lower the quality. You can see that the price here will drop significantly, which is nice. Uh, interior. Now, we don't really need luxury, so let's turn the style down, innovation down, luxury down. We don't really need that. You can see that as I'm dropping it massively, the price is dropping and the overall rating is not. So that's good. Comfort can go down as well. Safety, however, needs to be maxed out. That's important. And technology. Okay, the technology would increase the safety and make it better. So let's do that. Design focus. So style can go to hell, luxury can go to hell, but safety needs to be maxed out. Uh, cargo we can increase as well, it's gonna make it slightly better. And dependability needs to go up because that's the most important stat. Now the target demographic is kinda important. I'm usually starting with a female, uh, younger women, because I kinda like it and they're gonna be from yeah, let's keep it at upper middle class. So you can see that the specific uh, rating is now at 40 because it boosts the dependability and safety requirements and we excel in that, same as quality. Uh, the luxury has dropped immediately, the f power dropped immediately and performance dropped immediately. So we're basically marketing this car to people that will enjoy it for what it is. Uh, testing is also very important. If I increase the market demographic testing, you will see that it changes the stats across the board. Now, it doesn't mean, though, that more is always better. We can just increase it a tad and we'll get the effect that we want. Performance we really don't need. That one does, is not that important. Though, if I increase it just a bit, it's going to give me a boost. So let's keep it there. Fuel economy doesn't do anything really, so we can just drop it completely. Comfortability increases the luxury, we don't need that, so let's disregard it. Utility though, I think that increases the safety, yeah, so we need to max that one up. And reliability is also extremely important. So we can get this car to a specific rating of 44, which is awesome for a starting car and it's gonna cost only 777 bucks so this phaeton will make us a lot of money which is good so what i need to do here now is i need to build it and unfortunately it's gonna take 14 months to design it and the project cost is going to be extreme so here's where the development pace will come in handy because if we design this for 14 months, it's going to cost uh, 540000 If we drop it a bit, just by a couple of months, you can see that it dropped to nearly half of the project cost. And I can even drop it slight more. So if we design this car for 16 months, it's going to cost us 270000 bucks, and it's going to be ready on 1st of January 1902 which goes well for me. So I'm going to build it and I always name my Phaeton Natalia because it's, you know, it's uh, advertised to women. It's going to be a women's car and I like the name Natalia. So this is going to be our first brand Phaeton Natalia brand Republic Motors and trim is 1902 so let's build it and now you will see that the vehicle is being prepared so i think this is all for the first episode it's been very long and in the next episode we're gonna see how this car is going to do on the market so thank you all for joining me 
Uh, in the next one, we're going to pass the 16 months and start manufacturing our first car.